to your last assignment. Namely, you have to prepare a 15 slides PowerPoint presentation about abuse of ethics in research. I hope this is clear. If you have any questions, as I said previously, during my presentation, feel free to ask me. So we can continue. Informed consent. Does anyone know here what informed consent is? Can you please write down the answers if you heard before about this? No one? Okay. Informed consent is actually a written document where participants sign that they participate in the research voluntarily. It is a paper where, it is where the purpose of interview is described. It indicates that it's confidential. You can stop the interview at any question. There is no risk for you. You can also mention the approximate time here based on the pretest whether you have conducted it or not, or based on your best uh, opinion or guess. And preferably, you must get their signature, signature name and date because of the compliance with the law, of course. And this should, this should be a separate page, and it should not be attached to the notes you take. Why do you think this is important after you heard this? Informed consent. Do you have any idea? Okay, people are typing, which is good. Privacy rights and not to be sh and to be sure that it will not be misused. Yes, nice one. Yeah, the rules in advance. Okay, before we talk about this, we'll go back a little bit in the past. And we will talk about the Stanley Milgram experiments. Has anyone heard about Stanley Milgram experiments so far before? Please answer shortly with yes, no. No? Others? The other presenters? No? Okay. Then we can continue. He was a psychologist who had an experiment to test the obedience to authority. When persons are changing their behavior in response to a demand from an authority figure, uh, Stanley Milgram experiments, Philip, sorry, it's obedience. I hope it is clear. Philip? Okay. So, what did this person, here we have a picture of him. He had, he was a professor at Yale and Harvard at that time. He had an ad in a newspapers, and he made an experiment with 40 males. 40 male subjects on a different variety that had different variety of backgrounds. He made an experiment which had an idea to study the effects of punishment on learning on memory. Uh, the task was the subjects of the experiment to learn word pairs, and the teacher would punish them with electrical shock for wrong answers, which went from 15 volts slide shock to 450 volts, extreme shock. The learner, the person who had to learn, was actually a confederate of the experimenter, 
and he was put into chair, electrodes attached to the arms, and you can see how it looks like here on this picture. He was not actually being shot, uh, shocked, but teachers did not know this. Actually, the teachers were subjects of the experiment. The subject of the experiment, he had, they played the role of a teacher. And the actor who was playing, the person who was learning, the learner, was actually playing a tape, pre-recorded sounds. And when teacher would question continuing, experimenter told him that he must continue. This is the control panel. I hope you see it clearly. It goes from 15 volts to 450 volts. Uh, when 15 volts is a slight shot, then 75 volts we have the moderate shock. 135, we have strong shock. 150, you have very strong shock, etc. I hope it is clear so far. So, we will briefly describe the method here now in order for you to know the background of this experiment. The teacher who was the subject of the experiment, was given a list of word pairs. He was to teach to the learner. The teacher began writing the list of word pairs to the learner. And then, after he read them, he would read the first word of each pair, only the first one, and then would read four possible answers, which were given, of course, from the experimenter. And the learner would press a button to indicate his response response. If his answer was correct, the teacher would proceed to the next pair. Of course, sometimes he deliberately made a mistake. If the answer was not correct, incorrect, the learner would receive a shock with voltage increasing with each wrong number, with which wrong answer. Actually, in reality, as you can consider, the subject the learner was not receiving a shock. After the learner was separated, they were put in the same room, and then the learner was separated. He puts a tape recorder into the shock machine, which plays pre-recorded sounds for each shock level. And the subjects of the experiment were actually, as I said, the teachers, and they believe what they saw, that for each wrong answer, the learner would actually receive, actu would receive shocks. As I said, in reality, there were no shocks. What was the scenario, actually? The scenario was like this. When they made a mistake, at 75 volts, the learner should grant with pain if he was punished. At 120 volts, he should start to shout that these shocks are becoming painful. At 150 volts, he should cry out. He should say that I have enough from this experiment. His protestation should turn to agonized scream at 270 volts. And then at 300 volts, he should shout in desperation that he can no longer provide answers. But the experimenter should inform him that the teacher, that no answer was a wrong answer. And beyond 350 volts, the learner should be silent. I have two questions for you now. Did you understand the procedure? Please, everyone, of the experiment. Elisabetta, Matea, Philip. Others? Other participants, please? Be active. People? 
Do you hear me? Those who are present? Marina, okay? So, my question to you is, if you were the teacher, Maida, did you understood? Okay. So, my question is, if you were the teacher, at how many volts would you stop? Elisabetta thinks she will stop at the beginning. Beginning is 75. Oh, there is a person who say that she will never do that. Okay. Marina, also 75. Okay. You will not be part of such experiment. Okay, why? Elisabetta? I repeat, the respondents will not receive shocks. But I, as a teacher, would not know that there is no pain. Okay? Uh, I have a next question for everyone. What do you think? Out of those 40 people, how many of them continued after 150 volts? I repeat, out of 40 people, 4-0, four Marina thinks 50% went over 75, over 150, sorry. Even thinks majority continued, okay? Most of them, Maida, you think? Okay, at which voltage do you think they stopped? What do you think? At which voltage did they stop? In 315? Elisabetta, this is the answer. At 150. Even, uh, why do you think that they went Till the end. Ivan, please, Vidmar. I would like to say that Ivan says because the leader told them that it's okay to do so and they were relying on the leader of the experiment because of the instructions and also maybe suspicion that if this is an experiment should not really be hurt. 
before this experiment, even have you heard before of this experiment, even? Yes, uh, before this experiment, this scenario was given to, four, to 40 psychiatrists, and they were asked at which level the participants would stop. And most of them answered 150, like some of you, like uh, Matei or others. But what do you think happened in reality? What happened will surprise you. As I said, this was described to 40 psychiatrists, and they predicted that no one, no one will go beyond the 10th level, which was actually 150 volts. And there is actually a movie about this experiment, and you can download it. It is called The Tenth Level. And the results are that 26 out of 40, actually 65%, went all the way to 450 volts, which is potentially lethal. Can you imagine? Twenty-six. Only five stopped before 300 volts. Only five of them. So you can imagine. It was very stressful for them. They often protested, but they still obeyed. There are many follow-up studies done. They're trying to repeat this experiment. They were conducted on a variety of follow-up studies. When the experimenter, experimentator's status was changed, or the prestige, it was conducted by a private firm. And then the obedience dropped slightly to 48%. The proximity of the learner also, whether he was really close, then the obedience dropped. Also, it decreased even more when they had to make a contact to force him to sit down. Also, there was a proximity of authority figure. The obedience decreased when the experimenter phoned them and gave them direction to continue. And some even try to deceive, to deceive the experimenter that they are actually giving shocks, while in reality they were not, in the follow-up studies that, that were done. It was changed with three teachers in experiment when two refused to continue, and then the obedience drops, dropped a lot. So, as I said, numerous follow-up studies were conducted. They were tested if the findings were still true in different cultures but with slightly varying situation, with different genders, because there were only men, as I said previously in the original study. Some variations, but the results were more or less the same. People were, were still remarkably obedient. This was the conclusion. I will now tell you some details about this experiment that you may not hear about it. The learner was actually Mr. McDonoghue. He died out of a heart attack three years after the studies ended. His neighbor, neighbor who actually participated in the experiment as a teacher and administered shocks, tried to revive him but with mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, but unsuccessfully. Life is bizarre. Stanley Milgram was 27 years of age when he conducted these experiments. And the learner and the experimenter were given nine months of role playing to prepare for this experiment. Can you imagine? And one of the teachers was actually administering shock, who had gone all the way to 450, was invited to talk to a class of social psychology to students about his experience in the study. And the students who actually learned about this experience, at first they were silent, they could not believe what he was talking about. And they stared at him and they started accusing him. But he replied that you never know what you might have done in that situation. So the situation is very important. 
So it was actually that the experiment failed on many topics, but it was good for ethics that he was conducted. The experiment was conducted. I will just mention some of the reactions of the respondents. They had a profuse sweating. They were trembling. 10% of them left extremely upset. Some others have uh, unexplained hysterical laughter. And these were all mentally stable, healthy individuals, which were emotionally distraught only after 20 minutes and believed they were causing pain to another human being. Some reactions, like twitching, some of them were stuttering, twisting hands, pulling ears. They had, as I said, nervous laughter. But at the end of the experiment, they were debriefed and told them what had really happened immediately. If they were obedient, it was explained that this was normal behavior, which is, of course, true. And a few weeks later, they were sent a write-up of the research an explanation why did this happen. They were sent a questionnaire, and they were asked about their feelings about the study. And 43% of them said that they were very glad to have participated, and 40% were glad. Only 1% were sorry, or very sorry that participated. And there was no difference between those who participated versus those who didn't. Uh, people seemed to relax what they had done, and Milgram wrote that the same mechanism that allowed them to act, to perform the act, actually continued to justify the behavior. They were also interviewed one year later after the experiment, but no long-term distress was found. But there were some ethical considerations, as I thought. Subjects were generally receptive, and no long-term distress was found, but there was trauma. So the question here is, do the ends justify the means that we're using? Uh, how the experiment was received, how was uh, the reception in the public, in the scientific areas? The experiment received high praise in 1964, even the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences uh, gave prize for research to Milgram. He received congratu congratulatory uh, letters from all over the country, from scientists. There was interest in the media, but Milgram didn't want to have public interest because he didn't want the experiment to be publicized as the experiment who works if the subject does not know what it, what it is about. So it is actually a deception in research in one area where we have to balance the need for statistical accuracy and validity against ethics. So on the other hand, he was also highly criticized because he was being unethical. They were attacked his methods in the, in the journal American Psychologist, and there were polarization of opinions about the deception. Obviously, the experiment and the method may not have been entirely moral, but the question again is, do benefit outweigh the costs for the participants? We will talk about this later as well. And that's why at the beginning I said we have this uh, paper, which is called Informed Consent. Uh, the critics were that he was wrong because he deceived the subjects of the true purpose of his experiment. He was wrong because he believed that they're inflicting some other human person to suffer. And worst of all, he was putting them in a conflict situation that some of them found very stressful. They had trauma. This was critics by Diana Baumring. And she further argued that uh, Milgram experiment did not provide measures to protect the participants from the stress and that they were capable of brutal actions the entire experiment should have been terminated at the first because there was discomfort of the participants and participants could be alienated from further research, from participation. Another psychologist, Kelm, argued that 
the deception could have been done with other uh, similar non-deceptive uh, methods. The use of deception was not necessary because similar results could have been obtained. But Stanley Malgram defended his work. He said, adequate measures were taken to protect the participants. At the end, they were told about the study. They could withdraw the study from any time. The deception was explained. As I said, his subjects volunteered to take part. Nothing stopped them apart from orders from the authoritarian person, which was a scientist in a white coat. Nothing stopped them from refusing. And at the end, after the experiments, they were fully debriefed and assured they didn't hurt anybody. And their behavior was normal. He also said that deception was necessary because every Psychiatrists, 40 psychiatrists that he consulted, they have mistaken the results. They, if you remember, they said that no one would go after the 10th level. There were no indications that stress had lasting or injurious effects. After one year or month, uh, they were interviewed again, and they said that this experience even changed their life positively, of course. And his subjects said they were glad to have taken part and discovered an as important aspect of their own psychology. Uh, this actually permanently changed our understanding of the Holocaust. Why? Because in the explanations, uh, Nazis and Nazi leaders were demonized as pathological sadists and monsters who were just killing people. But Milgram who was actually a Jew, he observed that ordinary people submit to authority in his experiments. And he concluded one of the most fundamental lessons, that ordinary people, no matter what they were doing, a uh, job in the reality, without any particular hostility, that they can turn into agents in a terribly destructive process. And this had a big effect in social psychology, because at that time, there was a dilemma whether the personality or the situation determines how a person will act. And this was actually the results were in favor of situation because we tend to underestimate the power of situation. And Malgram wrote that actually it is much often the kind of person it is does not guarantee how he will react in a certain situation, but the situation will impose something. And the situation will determine how the, the person will act. Uh, the power of the situation, as I said, as you can see here, the initial study was done at Yale. You can see the high prestige setting at the University of Yale. And they, the Yale had reputation of a university. And this, this added to the authenticity of this experiment. This caused the subjects to continue administering electroshocks to high voltage, even they didn't want it to. What happened? Why it is important? Although the experiment fell out, after this study, virtually every university in the United States now has an institutional review board that must pre-approve studies using human subjects. Also. Uh, High-impact social studies forbidden the, forbid the use of deception and the research that will cause stress to participants. And there are three primary reasons for the decrease of uh, deception. What was seen in the Malgram study, because now we have a change of methods. It, there is a research in learning and cognitive issues rather than emotions. There is a level of awareness about ethical issues. And there are ethics committee, committee that now reviewed the the proposed research. Uh, at that time, in the 1940s, there were some constraints on how animal subjects actually were treated, but there were no constraints for people. Can you imagine that? It was left to the individual researcher to exercise his judgment. But by the 1970s, ethics, committee, ethics review committee were set up in almost all universities in North America. 
and human research was monitoring by these committees. Uh, in the 1990s, change occurred, occurred with introduction of bioethics. And this is how uh, human subjects are treated. Major change began in Canada in the 1990s with the establishment of one committee called Three Council Committee, and they required establishment of research ethical boards in every university. And they had to comply that all proposed human subject research met only not only not meets not only the ethical requirements but also as bioethical requirements. Why the Milgram study could not be sh could not conducted today? Because subjects need to be informed of the potential consequences and risks for their participation. Safety measures were put in place because the participants cannot be lied or told, or told only the part of the truth. In the US proposals, as you can see, uh, the method should clearly state that they're not disturbing the subjects. Consent formed, what we spoke to the beginning, must be signed, and subjects have the right to ask their input to be destroyed. So the conclusion is that always we must reach a balance between ethics and methodology. On the one hand, we, have, we must, as scientists, advance the science on the other hand, we have to, we must have a safeguard against harming other people because every interaction with another human being is actually poses risk potential for harming. And we have to allow the research to go forward, but there are limits and they could not be justified just by the means used and therefore there always should be a balance between ethics and methodology used. So, this is the first part. Do you have any questions so far? No one? Now we will continue with the second part. As I said, your assignment is to make a 15 slides PowerPoint presentation about abuse of ethics in research and you should not use Malgram experiment or any other follow-up studies that were done on Malgram experiments. You should find another case and present it from journal, website or whatever what you can find. There is a question, yeah, please. It's clear, okay. Yeah, it could be. It could be on any topic. You can decide whether it's old or new. Just should not be older than Malgram. <laughs> deal, we can continue. We came to the last part, report and presentation. Why are we writing the report? We're writing because someone could read it and could make some action based on this. So it should be easy to understand. The reader who will read it should be confident in the findings and should be clear about the actions that he, she should take. Why it is very important because this is the tangible product. As you know, research is intangible, but the tangible product of the research is actually the report, the presentation, what is the output of every research. Because management decisions are usually guided by the results, by the report, and the involvement of many persons is limited to reading this uh, written report or, or a participation in presentation and the most important is whether some person will use or not research in the future is whether he she whether they received a quality product at the beginning so 
We will now come back to the, risk, to the process, how it goes. This is just a short summary. As you remember, at the beginning, we have a problem definition. We have the approach explained. Then we conduct the field work, and we continue with data analysis. When the data analysis is finished, we go on the interpretation, conclusion, and writing recommendations. We have the oral presentation, and then we have reading of the report by the client. And at the end, we have the research follow-up. I will talk about each phase a little bit. First, we will start with the report format. As you can see, it should have the following elements, submission letter, why are submitting, how, for what purpose was conducted. It should have a title page, table of context, executive summary. The problems should be clearly stated. What approach did you have? How did you solve that? Which research design did you use? Uh, the data analysis, how did you conduct your analysis? What are the results? What are the conclusions from this uh, research? and which recommendations do you actually give? What are the possible limits that person who will actually make a similar research in the future, what they can you learn from us? And in the end, in the appendix, you can put the questionnaires and the discussion guides. A report should be written for a specific reader who will use the results. It should be written easy in a manner that is easy to follow. It should have uh, some very nice look because this is very important, whether it is in PowerPoint, Prezi, or some other form. It should be written objectively. This is the most important part, which is you should not uh, try to alternate the results. You should put uh, graphs and uh, some text with tables. I hope you all know how to read uh, uh, tables and graphs, and you all know how to make them. Yes, you can use case that was published. Sorry, I didn't answer the, the last question of Elisabetta. But where we will, uh, where will you find this uh, that is not published? Sorry. Your own research, or you will make it up, because at the end you must provide. Uh, the biography, the reference, where did you found that? Students, sorry for this interruption. I just saw the question from Elisabetta. I witness it, but okay, <laughs> I will not use it. Okay, since you witness it, please do not use it. So, you should address the problem. The problem should be clearly stated because this is also very important. If the problem is not clearly stated, then the one who reads cannot understand it. The research design should be uh, explained in non-technical terms. And how did you execute the procedures? Interpretation should be divided from the results and the conclusions or recommendation uh, made without some specification of the assumptions of limitations should be treated very cautiously. And you should provide, of course, uh, details whether the results are general, generalizable to the general public or to the public that you have of, uh, to your population of interest and whether they are or the instruments that you used were reliable and valid. This is an example how a table looks like. I suppose you all know. A table should have a title and a number. You should arrange the data items that they should be, uh, they should have a good uh, visual, in meaning that you understand from the first time that when you see it, what is it all about. If there is any source, you should put it at the end. And also, you should mention the base, meaning if you conducted the research, the, some question, if you ask uh, 100 people, then you should state that. Now we'll continue some 
explanations about pie charts. I suppose you all know what is a pie. Uh, you all eat burek, or you maybe ate it in your life. And in pie chart, the area actually represents <clears throat> the one that is associated with a percentage of total area with the value of a specific variable. And this should not be used for more than seven sections. And pie chart is not useful for trends or for overtime relationships. Here it is how it looks like. For example, I have presented here travel to work. A line chart is actually good for illustrating trends and changes over time. This connects series of data points using continuous lines. We can put some here, some series, forecasts, interpolations. Here I have presented the slides which shows target and actual sales. And you can see where there is no match. And at the end, we have the bar chart, which actually displays data in various bars. On the other hand, we have the histogram, which is a vertical bar chart. And it represents the, the relative or cumulative frequency of the answer of a specific variable. Here it is how it looks like. Preferred fast food by age. You can see that here pizza is most preferred. But here, those persons that are over 45 prefer both hamburger and pizza. And kebab has the least preference among all age groups. But I hope this is clear. I will skip this. This is how a stacked bar chart, meaning that it includes several answers in one bar. And it, this is very good for comparisons when you compare. So you can see the yellow color or the green color, how the trend goes by different conditions or in different target groups. And at the end, we have the 3D bar charts, which are not um, recommended for use because sometimes they are too complex and for visual look and for explanation. Now we'll continue with digital dashboard. Digital dashboard is actually an online platform where you instantly see the results. As I said, PowerPoint presentation or other form like Prezi, it is the output. But the output could sometimes be an online platform. And it should be well designed. So when you see it, you get a picture of what was researched. This is how a sample market research dashboard looks like. Different measures are presented on this slide. Uh, we will continue. And we have came to the topic of oral presentation. And as I said at the beginning, the key is preparing. If, if you remember from my first presentation, I said, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. Or well begun is half done. So the more time you involve in preparing, the better you will be at the presentation. And should be a written script or detailed outline should be prepared, prepared for the presentation in front. And it must be tailored to a specific audience. You should ask who will be the audience at the beginning or before when you prepare your presentation. And you should rehearse it at home several times, maybe in front of the mirror. It depends from you. It is also advisable to use some visual aids, such as tables, graphs, because we cannot all remember everything. And it is good that you maintain eye contact with the public and interact with them. I hope so far this was clear, right? No questions? No? Uh, some words like, uh, you know, all right, please avoid them. They should not be used. And here, there is one recommendation that the KISS principle is used, meaning 
keep it simple and straightforward. What you want to say, just say it simple and go straightforward with the story that you intend uh, to say. And this uh, the acronym KISS comes from that <coughs> abbreviation. The body language should be employed. So some general rule is that uh, you should not put your hands above your head or below you, below your waist. You should not wave with them uncontrollably. You can also rehearse that at home. You can ask someone to tell you a feedback about your presentation. And the la uh, you should vary the tone when you talk, you know, the pitch, the quality. You should articulate it. And at the end, you should make a strong closing. And that's it with the conclusion. And then you finish. I hope it was clear. It was uh, nice working with you. Do you have any? This would be all, I think, for today's presentation. Ah, the research follow-up, sorry, I almost forgot. That you should answer question always. After the end of the study, after the end of, the end of presentation, you should try to answer the question that the client or the person who ordered the presentation has. And also, you should write what you have learned with this new research that you undertake and what, was, what, you, what limitations you had and what others that do similar research on the same topic should try to avoid or use in the future of research. So students, do you have any questions regarding the assignment, the today's presentation? Not at the moment. Just to remind you that your deadline is next Monday, 25th. This is the last. And then we finish. I will put all your grades into the system on the next day when you submit them. Yeah, this is uh, yours and mine <laughs> for this year. Last e Profman webinar. Hope you enjoy it. Yeah, we, we can go now to celebrate the new year. But when you finish the assignment, I must remind you. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Have a nice work.